behalf of City Arts Nashua, I would like to thank you for joining us today and supporting the West Pearl Street mur Mural Project. My name is Judy Carlson. I'm on the board of City Arts Nashua, and I'm the project manager for the Mural Project. And I really want to thank the National Historical Society for hosting us today. If you haven't noticed already when you came in the room, they have the old Pearl Street um, ledger over on the right, your left. And it's part of their Adopt an Artifact program. So go take a look. And if anybody's up for adoptions, uh, it is looking for sponsors. Um, and there's information on the, if you haven't gotten it already, on the uh, registration table about the mural project. And there's donation forms as well. And anybody who can and would like to make a donation, uh, it's tax deductible. And we take donations in any size whatsoever. And we welcome your help with the support. And I'd also like to introduce um, Margie Bollinger Hogan, who's over here beside me. Uh, she's the president of City Arts Nashua, and she's here taking your money at the door as well. <laughs> and I'm very pleased to uh, introduce here Barbara Andrews. Why don't you just style and stand up, Barbara? She's the artist that's going to be doing the mural, which out in the front of the room you can see the rendering of what the mural is going to look like on the wall of um, 83 um, West Pearl, be that's behind the TD Bank. And what Barbara has up here is she is making a painting, she doesn't have it finished yet, of what the mural's gonna look like. We're, we call it the mini mural. And she's graciously donated it to help raise funds. Uh, as soon as she finishes it, we're going to do a raffle of only 100 tickets at $25 each. So if you're interested, please keep in touch uh, at www.cityartsnashua.org, and we'll be doing some publicity on it, and we'll be selling the tickets, and one lucky person will win it. Uh, her paintings that size go for, what, two fifty, three fifty, dollars and up yeah. uh, easily. And if you don't win it, you get a tax deduction. <laughs> and let's see. Oh, also, I wanted to mention that CRC Nashua is the fiscal sponsor for the Nashua International Sculpture Symposium, and they're having their open house over at the library at 3 o'clock today to kick off this year's Sculpture Symposium. It's got a Hispanic theme this year. They'll be doing the sculptures um, behind NIMCO over in the mill yard, but today is the kickoff reception. And then I'd like to introduce a man who doesn't need a lot of introduction. Alan Minoyan, I'm sure all you, a lot of you here are already part of his fan club. <laughs> Alan worked for the City of Nashville as a downtown development specialist and assistant economic development director for the city since from 1994 <coughs> to 2003. He currently serves as the economic development specialist for the great city of Auburn, Maine, and is the principal of his form-based code consulting firm about place partners. A lot of people have asked me, doesn't Alan work for Arlington, Massachusetts? Because they see all his posts on Facebook. And I, Alan's been in his new job, what, a couple weeks? About a month. About yeah. a month. And in spite of moving and having a new job and starting a new job, he was gracious enough to come and help us raise funds for the Mirror Project today. And we're very grateful for him to take this time. And he has, as you know, for over 20 years, he's come conducted countless tours up and down the streets of Nashua. Uh, it's attracted thousands of residents and tourists. And today we get him here in this room and we don't even have to walk. So thank you very much, Alan. <laughs> 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 Let's get out of here, go in the streets, huh? <laughs> It is so. It's a little unusual for me to be contained uh, in a room uh, doing this. Um, uh, for many years, we have we really, and I'll tell you, it's one of the most rewarding memories of uh, my time serving um, the people of Nashua was out doing um, a lot of those um, heritage walking tours. Uh, boy, I could just, I could write a, cute, a hip little book about a thousand stories of just when we would be out uh, doing those in the early years. And it was uh, quite peculiar back then. I remember being in the, uh, what we call now the Tree Streets neighborhood, the old West End neighborhood and such on 
hot August nights, on Thursday it's the middle of summer, when everyone in those neighborhoods is out on their stoops, everyone's out on the street, and it's just, and here we'd be romping up, you know, Ash Street or Vine Street, now with about, uh, you know, oh, I don't know, about 80 people. <laughs> and I can remember the uh, National Police Department cruisers pulling up on us, uh, thinking there was a riot going on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, something very peculiar and odd as to why would there be such a, a mass of people, uh, you know, uh, taking over these streets. And I can remember, uh, which actually was very important and s I think significant, and that a lot of the young kids that live in these neighborhoods um, would come out and approach us saying, what are all you people doing here? And we'd be pointing at their buildings and homes around their neighborhoods and, and we're, you know, saying to them in a very, um, you know, uh, matter of fact way that your neighborhood is really the heritage and cultural treasure house of this city. And talking with and these little kids on their bikes saying, what? This what are you kidding? This is, you know. <laughs> but I often, uh, I believe, uh, and hope that it did impact a lot of the young people that they might take a second look. And it always made me feel good when we'd do these types of tours that people would go on and they'd email me. Well, I wouldn't even have email when I started in 1993. Uh, but just calling and saying that, geez, Alan, you know, I've lived in this city. I moved here from, you know, wherever for eight years and I've driven past that building of that place for, you know, many, many years and I never thought to look at it. And after that tour, my God, I stop and I really notice and look at it. So it's things like that, that the, uh, the work uh, we felt had significance. And all this, what City Arts Nashua uh, is doing um, uh, in terms of this type of public art and public space art, it's all about what we call uplifting or ennobling the public realm. And what this, folks, is is known as the economics of place. Uh, this is serious economic development. Anytime you do public art, uh, preservation of culture, doing things like heritage walking tours, what you are doing is engaging in what is called the economics of place. This is how uh, downtowns compete with automobile oriented strip corridors and strip malls and malls and such. Uh, uh, people and, you know, I've been practicing the profession of downtown redevelopment now for 25 years and I remember we were thought of as sort of radical back in the late 80s and early 90s. A lot of folks saying, don't waste your time. Why even bother wasting your time trying to fix up these old downtowns or trying to get businesses? What business would come into, you know, these downtowns anymore? Why would people shop there? Why would people spend any time there, you know, uh, if they didn't have to? And uh, we were looked upon, I think, as maybe, you know, a little, I don't know, maybe a little touched and out there and uh, dreamers and not being rational or realistic about things. And uh, now, of course, all this is known as new urbanism, you see. We didn't know we were new urbanists back then. We were just <laughs> doing it, man. We didn't know we were engaging the economics of place. We were just doing it. And it's good to see now the rising generation of, of young people uh, and, uh, are realizing how cool it is. The final breakthrough is not, yeah, we shop downtown, we go to restaurants downtown or other things. The, the, the final threshold is we live downtown again. And once people finally realize, uh, you know, I was born in 1962, and the American dream for my generation we were taught is, you know, get out and you buy a beautiful home in a suburban neighborhood on a cul-de-sac road, you know, with two acres of land, a nice, and this is, you know, making it, um, it's good to see that uh, downtowns now are finally, of course, all the rage, the place where the rising generation wants to live. When I was in Arlington and Cambridge, while working there, I loved it because you have a whole generation of young people in their 20s. They don't want to own automobiles. I've lived long enough and practiced this profession long enough where I've actually seen this happen over 20 years. They're not interested in, they don't own televisions and they don't want to own cars. How un-American. <laughs> My God. Okay. <laughs> Let's get to our business here. So it's a privilege and honor to be here. Uh, so let's talk about West Pearl Street. And let's talk in particular about um, the Tremont, what came to be known as the Tremont uh, House or Hotel, originally the Pearl Street House later became uh, now, which, and it's an extraordinary piece of architecture, commercial architecture, which is the, uh, the TD Bank building now, but the second national bank 
uh, of Nashua, the building itself. And we'll take a little bit of a journey, you know, down into West Pearl Street, which really was probably one of the most, I think actually was the most fascinating side street in all of downtown Nashua. So we're going to start um, just talking about the fact that Nashua is a planned, was an experimental planned industrial city. It was, it was the first generation, the prototypes. Uh, Waltham, Massachusetts, 1817. My hometown, my home city of Lowell, Massachusetts, for, right? National, if you ever go down to the great urban national park in Lowell, and it is a national park, uh, the first birthplace of the American Industrial Revolution. It was a full planned industrial community. Lowell uh, rose uh, and went up uh, in 1821, 22. A lot of folks don't appreciate that Nashua was really the next, and it was an experimental. This was the first generation planned industrial cities. Nashua Manufacturing Company chartered in 1823. And I love that map over there on the wall. You can't see it close up, boy, but there it is. There's the first, you know, original survey plan of what became downtown Nashua, and you can see the first of the streets that were laid out there. The thing about, and you'll notice, folks, before uh, this happened, they laid this out, there was, there were no, uh, uh, there was no uh, urban grid streets in ancient Dunstable then up to that time. There was no such a thing. They had never seen such a thing up in these parts. You had your country roads and your ancient roadways. Here, these, the, the uh, owners of the mill came in and they're going to build a planned industrial city, a machine. It is the entire neighborhood is designed as part of the machine that was the mill and the machinery in the mill and the folks that ultimately worked, they were all part of this literally integrated machine that was there to produce goods and to make profit. Um, and here they lay out a full right angle straight urban street grid. No such thing was ever seen up in these parts and that's the real first mark of uh, of urbanism, if you will. And when they, um, they laid out that street grid, the first uh, mill, mill number one in Nashua Manufacturing, started construction in 1825, went into operation in 1826. But as part of that, they lay out the street grid, and the first streets uh, that were really laid out was Factory Street, what is today Factory Street. Main Street was actually there. It wasn't Main Street. It was known as the Great Road, if you will you know, from Boston and down. But they laid out Factory Street, they laid out uh, High Street, they lay out Walnut Street and Chestnut Street, and then they lay out this little street called Pearl Street. Okay? Uh, those streets were laid out because that is where they built the, uh, the, the original boarding houses for the operatives, the Yankee Mill Girls. The first workforce for this town, the first industrial workforce in America were women, young women between the ages of 14 and 28 or so, all Yankee women. At this time, there was no such thing up here as an Irish person or a French Canadian person or any Roman Catholics, <laughs> God forbid, my God, Roman Catholics, I mean, wow, um, let alone Armenians, Greeks, Lithuanians, Poles, all the rest. So. Uh, laid out there and it was actually Asher Benjamin who was one of the fathers of American architecture that the National Manufacturing Company hired from Boston and came up and laid out the grid. So just the grid itself, all right, the street plan is part of, if you will, the design and architecture of this overall unified composition of the planned industrial uh, town. So just some quick dates, and then National Manufacturing 1823. Right off the bat, because this was a planned industrial city, and America had never had any such thing. And they were, uh, the great concern in America was, we don't want to bring industry to America. They saw, by the way, all this idea they got from uh, England, and in particular, uh, Robert Owen, a uh, visionary uh, man who built, and of, uh, of course I just lost the name of the uh, town over in Scotland he built on the Clyde River. Oh boy, anyway. He lays out in England what they described the factory system and mill system in England. The, the, the labor force in England were children. Okay, this was the largest workforce uh, in England. And what they saw in England here in America, they described it as a catastrophe of humanity. Um, and it, it was a horrific system that literally consumed and destroyed young children. By the time they were 15 or 20, their bodies were spent and they were gone. They said in America, wait a minute, we fought the American Revolution for freedom and independence. Uh, it was a culture of agrarianism and the yeoman farmer and independence. When they saw something like this, 
they thought slavery you're going to become uh, you're going to lose your independence you're going to go work in this corporation and your life is no longer and then they saw the social ills it brought and we didn't like that in America either so they said how can we bring industry here to America manufacture thing because we, we bought all our manufactured goods from Great Britain we manufacture nothing in America that's why they had power over us they said let's do it here we will build the text the cotton textile mills but we're going to build boarding houses for the workers. In other words, we're going to make sure they live clean, decent lives because they're going to live in our properties. Secondly, the most interesting thing and touches right on the, our West Pearl Street here is going to be, they said, we're going to build a schoolhouse. Uh, can you picture, any, well, actually, up until recently now when we have development impacts where some developers, now if you build developments large enough, they do have to contribute to the building of new schools or fire stations and such. But back then, the thought of uh, a corporation coming, we're going to manufacture something, and we're going to build a schoolhouse to boot. So the manufacturing company says, we're going to build the mill where the workers will work. We will build the boarding houses where our workers will live, and we're going to make sure they live clean, decent lives in these boarding houses. And we're going to build a schoolhouse because we want it to be a civilized, educated, decent, laboring force and population here. They laid out the road work. They rebuilt the Main Street Bridge. They laid this whole thing out. That schoolhouse, and by the way, they also decided we need to build a, a, a hotel as well because there are going to be a lot of new workers and folks coming into this great new city. So here I have uh, from 1825, and there's the original little article from the old Nashua Constellation, uh, Nashua Hotel. The subscriber would inform his friends and the public that he has taken that large and commodious house recently fitted up by the Nashua Manufacturing Company in Nashua Village on the County Road, that was Main Street, uh, leading from Concord to Boston, and uh, intends sparing no pains in furnishing said house with the choicest liquors. <laughs> that was the main thing they wanted to get across. I had to let you know, we have plenty of alcohol here. So you want to stay here. The best attendance to the gentleman the weary traveler and parties of pleasure, to whom may please to favor him with their custom. So that was actually the first. Before that, though, they were two small, they were actually small taverns. Up at, you gotta understand, the original town center of ancient Dunstable was up where Riviere College is now. That was the old historic town center before they, the mills came in here. That's why that cemetery and burial ground is up there, by the way. Um, but there was a tavern up there called Cummings Tavern late 18, uh, 1790s and such, early 1800s. Up at this end was the old Tyler's Tavern, which is sort of now where the first church is. That later became the Indian House, okay, uh, Tavern and all that stuff. But Tyler's, and all that was because they laid out the Middlesex Canal, folks, uh, right down in my hometown of Lowell, connecting the Merrimack River up here with Boston Harbor. And they made that canal connection right up here by 1803. Young man named Daniel Abbott, Daniel Abbott House, smart lawyer, Harvard graduate, came up here 1803 in his 20s, gave this great speech, and everyone decides, ah, oh, this guy's going to be the great, you know, visionary of Nashua. They launched a canal boat down by the mouth of the Nashua River at the Merrimack, and that's why the first, uh, and if you look, that's why Canal Street is called Canal Street. There was a boating canal that connected up here, Railroad Square, okay, with the uh, Nashua River and the Merrimack. Anyway, what I'm getting at is they were building these taverns and hotels, but this new word hotel really came in with the Nashua Manufacturing Company. So that, and by the way, this first Nashua Hotel was right where um, the Oval is in Railroad Square right now. Okay, it later became the Central House. And blah, 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 blah. So just to give you that quick background, there were other hotels. Um, West Pearl Street is laid out 1824-25, again, when they lay out the original first streets. Uh, East Hollis Street is laid out in 1827, and they did that because they were building, uh, the original ferry was down where the bridge is now going over to Hudson, actually a little downriver, the original ferry, but then these gentlemen also got together and said, we need a bridge there, and they built the Taylor's Falls Bridge, which was a toll bridge, so they decided we need these roads to connect down, which we know now is the great bottleneck, as people trying to get through Nashville, right, and get to Hudson, and for how many years are we trying to solve this never-ending problem of 
What do we do with all this traffic? All trying to get down to right that for circumferential highways, right, folks? For 40 years, talking about circumferential highways, Broad Street Parkway, all these things. So this has been the eternal, you know, issue of how to get down to uh, that bridge and area. West Hollis Street uh, is laid out in 1828. The next year, uh, 1830, they extended from Maine down to Chestnut Street. 1832. East Pearl Street is laid out by the National Manufacturing Company. They actually laid that out themselves. So they're building this whole network of roads. So you've got to understand then, say, looking at this map, there you see the great textile mill, National Manufacturing Company, Indian injury, the original Indian held mill was down here, which then becomes Jackson Manufacturing in 1830 or so, something like that. Dean, my dates aren't as smart as I used. That's why I'm glad Dean's here. He's going to help me and catch me because I, I used to be really do it. I used to be really good at this stuff. And I'm, okay. And then, of course, the great original uh, development, this happens with all development, you know, it starts at a cradle or a core. And the original blocks, actually it was Factory Street was the original merc great mercantile street of the new planned industrial township. So everything starts right down here at the Main Street Bridge around Water Street today. And, uh, and what happens then is historically that as the town begins to grow and develop and expand. It starts heading southward, southward, southward down Main Street. And that's why, unfortunately, we've lost a lot of those original historic buildings. You can do an architectural history walking tour, and you can start with the oldest here and literally go chronologically through time as you head south, you know? So West Pearl Street, which is sort of right here, okay, it was really the southernmost fringe. By the time they started talking about in the 1840s, we might build this new house or hotel. And it was actually described in the history of Nashville by Parker saying, Pearl Street was the southern limit of trade. The only store upon it, east or west, was that of John Blunt at the corner of Chestnut Street. And John Blunt uh, moved here to Nashville in 1832. If you ever go out to the uh, Woodbine Cemetery, the Blunt family stones are one of the actually most impressive headstones you'll see out there. Very interesting history. That family that were the longest running merchants in Nashua, they went through three generations. But so this area down here at Pearl Street, it was just known, was really out on the very fringe and end of uh, the boonies. Um, and what you really had in 1847-48 when they started contemplating the new uh, Pearl Street house laid at Tremont, and you still see it here in this 1875 uh, map, uh, like today where, you know, Alex Shoe Store is, and Surf, used to be Coyote Cafe, and going all the way down to City Hall. These were just great homes, individual homes of more of the prominent families. So really picture from West Pearl Street to Pearl Street South was all just great residential homes. There was no commercial buildings. There were blocks at that time. And out there you had uh, Thomas Chase, which was right in the corner where Alex Schuster is today. His home was right there. He actually was the owner of the Washington House, the other famous tavern, which is now in the corner of uh, Factory Street in Maine, where the new yogurt place is. I think it's a new yogurt place, right? OK, the old Bessie Bryant building. Thomas Chase House, the Hunt, the famous Hunts, as in Hunt Memorial Building. John Hunt and his brother Israel lived in the next house, like where today's surf is. The Hunt family home was right there. And then the uh, Estee family, Peter Clark, Stevens, on the east side of Main Street, heading again south from the Pearl Streets, the Bangs family, the Wrights, the Kimballs, the Eldridge, you know, that's why little Eldridge Street, if you ever go up to Bagel Alley, right? And by the way, Mr. Eldridge had a bakery there back even then, so it's appropriate. There's still a great bagel bakery down on Eldridge Street. And now, so what I'm getting at, all residential from that point down. So here we have then, uh, March 18th of 1847 in the uh, Nashua Gazette. And we had two newspapers then, the Nashua Telegraph, which was the Whig newspaper. Today we'd call it the Republican conservative. The newspaper of corporations, railroads, banks, the American system. which was the right way America should be. And these newspapers back then, we think newspapers are political today. They're not political at all. Man, read the newspapers in the 1840s and 50s and 60s. And <laughs> I mean, it was no, uh, no holds barred. I mean, viciously political, each one. So the Telegraph was the Whig newspaper. And the, Na the Nashua Gazette was the Democratic newspaper, the paper of the 
original traditions that we fought the American Revolution on, the independent individual. We don't like big government. It's actually turned upside down though. Back then the Democrats, we don't like big government. We don't like the federal government. We don't uh, like standing armies. armies. We like things decentralized. Let us do everything on our own way. No government, no, thing, no big corporations, none of these big controlling things. And the Gazette was run by Israel Hunt, the Hunt family, brother John Hunt and later the Whittemores. So in the Gazette, first article entitled New Hotel, March 18th, 1847. We understand a company has been formed in $8,000, which in 1847, folks, was a fortune subscribed for the purpose of erecting a new hotel, and they use that word hotel, at the corner of Main and Pearl Streets, where Mr. Emery's store and a blacksmith wheelwright shop now stand. That's why I love reading these old articles. You find things you can't find at this, so now we know there was a Mr. Emery there with his shirt and a blacksmith stand. Um, the company that will erect the hotel there should be immortalized because it will remove the wagons, carts, and other rubbish which block up the sidewalks in, the, in that vicinity. <laughs> this is the classic Gazette. They were, it was the most colorful newspaper, and they would just write this way. We would rather sail through Chardbis and Scylla. I have to look up on my ancient mythological Greek stuff. I think these were horrific hellish places in mythology, either Greek or Roman. That Okay, we would rather sail through Sharbdis and Scylla then navigate through the collection of carts and rubbish in a dark night. <laughs> Barked shins and bloody noses, exclamation point. Erect a hotel there forthwith, we say. <laughs> now, by the way, who has to walk past that mess going home every day is Israel Hunt, who, as I told you, lives right where? Surf is today. He was writing the news, the editor then, so this was him saying, clean our neighborhood up up there. And I say it's like because it was also in their property to say, yeah, build this great new investment up there because then our land and property will become more valuable for future commercial development. We still like that in Nashua a lot, <laughs> <laughs> which was good. So you can see it was a real mess up there. It was dark. There was nothing up there. So I love reading out and you can get a sense of what, was, what they were doing there. Uh, the National Telegraph, two days later, March 20th, because they got to get right in on it. These guys were competing day by day by who gets... A new tavern, and they call it a new tavern. The Gazette called it a hotel. Wow. Since the American House establishment, now folks, the American House was the other sort of hotel where the old Sears building is today. I forget what's in the Sears today. Ah, Pompanusic Mills, right? There's still, yeah, the Sears building. That was where the old American House, there was an old inn there across the street. It did stand there for a while. Built, I think, probably in the early 1830s. Since the American House establishment has been sold, a project has been started to build a first-class public house of brick on the corner of Pearl and Main Streets, opposite the present American House. It would be kept by Captain William Adams, the popular landlord of the American House. So this guy's splitting from across the street, deciding, eh, I'm a going to go in with uh, these guys. And he was, by the way, one of the subscribers of the new company. The project is bound to go ahead and prosper. Very, so everyone's really amped about this in town in the spring of 1847. Then the Gazette, April 1st, a few weeks later, and it says, entitled, The Pearl Street House. The prospects of the contemplated hotel in this place held a meeting last Saturday evening and organized by choosing Thomas A. Gillis, David Baldwin, William Adams, directors, George Sawyer, Peter Clark, and Peter Clark lived just a few houses up on Main Street next to the Hunts, Isaac Spaulding, and Isaac lived almost, you know where the Spaulding house is now? It's right next to the, in front of the Methodist church. And that was Isaac Spaulding's house. So they were all kind of right there, you see, saying, yeah, we want this to happen. How many of you today would like to see a new hotel going up across the street from your house? <laughs> you can imagine the, the traffic impact. We can't have it. Right? <laughs> we'll destroy the, that I make a lot of, but today, to do such a thing would destroy the value of your home, right? You'd ever, the neighborhood would fight it. Back then, it added to the value of your home. Okay. We understand that has been decided to call it Pearl Street House. And this was its original name. The requisite amount, 12000 So just in two weeks, it goes from 8000 up to $12,000. 
So they're really deciding, let's really go all out. Has been subscribed, and its erection will be commenced as soon as possible. Now, Thomas Gillis was the man behind creating and building the Pearl Street House, later the Tremont House. This guy is really fascinating. So Thomas Gillis was born in uh, uh, Daring in 1806, okay? He comes to Nashua in 1828. So he's what? He's 22 years old. He arrives here with nothing, this young 22-year-old man seeing, wow, look at this. In 1820, so the first mill had just been up two years, so he's right here when all this is just happening and, and sees that this is the future. I have to go down and this is, you know, make this my life. And um, he starts off with the National Manufacturing Company as what was called a picker boy. And even being 22 was rather old to be a picker boy. Picker boys were usually literally, you're talking 10, 11, 12 years old. He goes in, uh, and, and what the picker boy was, was when the bales of raw cotton would come up, by the way, from the south, picked by the, and by the way, none of this works without the institution of southern slavery. I won't go on that whole jag, that's a whole nother lecture thing. All right. So the raw bales of cotton are coming up here. Uh, by the way, in, uh, oh no, by 18, well, in 1828 when he was here, there was no railroad. How did the cotton, how does the cotton everything get up here? There's no railroad. Middlesex Canal, it was all being boated up on the Merrimack River. Would go into the boating canal on Canal Street, come up on the barges up above the Jackson Falls Dam. You're up above the, in the mill pond now, you come up on the Main Street Bridge, bring it up by Water Street, and you unload the cotton bales. There is no railroad, all by water. So the picker boy would be the first thing. Here's the massive big bales of cotton. These things were massive things. And you'd break those big bales open in a particular room, or and you'd go through picking. <laughs> Because there'd be a lot of stuff, even though it went through the cotton, Jenny, is that right? Elias Howe? No. Cotton gin. Just clean it. I don't know if that was in my But anyway, I don't even know if that was invented yet by 1828. But he would pick the raw. So this was like sort of the bottom line job. You just, you know. Hence, hence the picker building. That's where hence the picker building. <laughs> and the phrase, have you lost your, what, cotton, cotton picking mind? mind? Picking this stuff all day, <laughs> you know, a one-ton bale of cotton. This is what you do all day. Have you lost your cotton-picking mind? Um, so it was the, right. No, no great skills necessary, right, guys? So this is where he starts off in 1828. By 1835, he is the agent of the National Manufacturing Company Mills. He's the boss. How this man does this, I'd love to know, and I don't have that history between 1828 and wow. And he, be, he remains the agent, and the agent back then of the manufacturing companies was God, the boss, the man, that's, and, but, and they own this whole village and town. So he was, okay, the man, the power. He was the agent of the National Manufacturing Company from 1835 to 1853. So when he launches this venture in 1847, he is the agent of the National Manufacturing Company. And they, you know, so just to point out the power of this guy. Not only that, he was also the owner, while well, he happens to be the agent of the manufacturing company, he's the owner of the ironworks in Patterson, New Jersey. He's also the owner of the ironworks in, uh, in Knoxville, Tennessee. I love these guys. You read these histories back then. They would be like presidents and on board of like 20 companies at once. Like, where do these guys get this? And how did they do this? And then to boot, of course, he was the president of the Nashua Gas Light Company and the agent of the Vale Mills, which was down on Salmon Brook. He just did all this sort of at once, you know, and many other things in between. So this is who Thomas Gillis was that was really the man behind uh, this whole thing. By the way, right across the street from this now, uh, where the wonderful new Nashua Bank is, Frank T's and the guys at Nashua Bank, that building, across, beautiful brick, is one of the treasures of Nashua. That is the original 1847 Third Orthodox Congregationalist Church. It was built simultaneously with the Pearl Street House in 1847, the two of them, both brick. Guess who the great leading proponent was and the, and the person that made, built that church was? Thomas Gillis. 
So he does this picture now. So you have this end of town where, as you described, there's old car and rubbish and nothing. And this guy decides, obviously, we're going to build uh, this section. So not only does he build this, but across the street, I'm going to build a new Orthodox congregational church. And he gave $3,000 for the building of that. So this guy was putting out big money at that point in his life. So... As you now folks go up that area, next time you're in the square, say, thank you, Thomas Gillis, for, you know. All right. Isaac Spaulding was the other guy behind this. And you know, I just said where the Spaulding house is, right by the, Met. it's, again, a great survivor. And by the way, that home was also built right in 1846, 47. So they were all deciding, these guys involved in this, like, let's, we're all going to start building right around here. He built his home there. Isaac Spaulding was born in Ipswich, uh, New Ipswich, in 1796. He comes to Nashua in 1826, two years before Gillis. Young man also, obviously. He became the leading merchant. He was, boy, if you look at the ads back then in the newspapers, in the 18th, he was the man. And it said he sold everything. Because they knew at this point, come to these great new planned industrial cities, the population, they're going to need everything under the sun. So just get there, open a store as fast as you can, and sell everything everything and anything you can, and you're going to become wealthy. And they did. They really did. It's an amazing story, actually, of, of finance and capital and how it was all sort of built. But he, he's a merchant in iron, steel, general merchandise. He was with the Concord Railroad, which was completed in 1840, 1842. Alton becomes the president, another one of these guys, then he becomes the president of the Concord Railroad, treasurer of it. And then for 25 years, he is the president of the Nashua Bank as well. All this simultaneously. So you see the, the power group here that's behind this. Um, George Sawyer, the great attorney also, was the other proponent in this. Uh, Sawyer's house was close to where the old city hall building was. OK, so what is near that now? Uh, this was the old uh, where, see, I'm, I'll show you how old I'm going back to where um, um, uh, Carter's men's store was on Main Street. Uh, uh, why am I blanking out what's in there now? But anyway, Sawyer's house was down by there originally. See how long I've been gone? I don't even know my stores anymore on Main Street, Chris. Shamed. But Sawyer was a fascinating guy, great attorney, uh, became a Supreme Court Justice in New Hampshire. He just stayed for a few years, though, because he, he wasn't making enough money. So he said, ah, he resigns from the Supreme Court in New Hampshire. <laughs> He's like, I want to make more money. I can go off, I don't need this. But he was a judge of the Court for Common Pleas, great, one of the greatest legal minds and attorneys in the history of this city. And uh, he's a, uh, a graduate of Phillips Exeter and Bowdoin College close where I am now, up in New Brunswick, and his very good close friends were William Pitt Fessenden, um, Hawthorne, Longfellow, Franklin Pierce, his close buddies. Okay, so influential guys. That's who was behind all this. I love this quick one, uh, National Gazette Spring, at the same time they're doing this. It's just entitled A Mud Scow. Actually, a mud scout wanted, said, wanted a mud scout to sail from a point about opposite the Universalist Meeting House, which is High Street, where High Street is today. Wanted a mud scout to sail from a point about opposite the Universalist Meeting House down Main Street as far as Pearl Street. So here's the Gazette, they're cute little, they always do this stuff saying, the street basically from High Street up to Pearl's where they're doing this is a mud river. So we need like a, a boat to get, okay, so that's classic National Gazette, these little needly things in this funny kind of way. And the Beesom House is, ends up being built across the street by William Beesom. Uh, this is next to the Spalding House. I just wanted the point I'll make here is this is where they were building the finest houses at the time. And the Beesom House was such a fine house, they actually did painted marbling on the exterior of this building. In 1847, they were trying to make it look literally like a... Uh, and there were old photographs of the Beesom House. It came down when they built the Sears building, I think, in the 30s or such. It was a grand house. So the point is here, from this area, you started really seeing the most info. Before Concord Street was Concord Street, where all the great men, it was down there in Prospect Street. Okay. As they're building the uh, Pearl Street house, and this happens a lot, 
And by the way, now when some of our friends say, why do we need OSHA? Why do we need all these regulations for workers and workplace things? Hey, man, you go back in the newspapers from this time and even all the way up until, you know, it's horrific what you read of what happened to people that worked in these places, whether the laborers building buildings or don't even get me going on the mills, it's just beyond carnage. Uh, and if you read history, you'll understand why there are so many horrific bureaucratic regulations on employers and such now. But October 1847, so they're building this thing, Gazette, article entitled Accident. On Tuesday, the staging on the northeast corner of the new hotel, which would be the corner right up at your right-hand side there. On the northeast corner of the new hotel in this place gave way and precipitated two workmen who were laying brick to the ground. They fell from the fourth story, exclamation point. That's a picture jump, stepping off a four-story building, you know. One of them had his nose broken and his shoulder somewhat injured. The other was not materially injured. It was a miracle they were not both killed. <laughs> Tough guys. Imagine falling four stories and I broke my nose. <laughs> it's like, wow, man. Superhuman. You see that a lot, though, uh, when they were built. I won't get into this, but very often workers, these things collapse and they would fall off these buildings. So it shows you interesting things happening. Uh, October 1847, Telegraph, things about town. Speaking about Pearl Street, the Pearl Street house is going up as rapidly as it can and looks very lofty already. <laughs> so they were saying, this is their own way of saying, wow, this place, well, Nashville is really becoming something. This is quite, you know, the uh, impressive building. And we observe also that the school district has recently enlarged their schoolhouse on Pearl Street and made quite a commodious affair of it. We're going to get back over now to the brick. And that schoolhouse that the National Manufacturing Company built on, uh, actually originally wasn't built, but it was moved to West Pearl Street, um, uh, was known as the old brick. And you can go back and find old stores and just refer to it this lovingly as the old brick. And in March of 1848, the Telegraph prints a quick brick school visit. The upper rooms were uh, actually Mr. Shute was the principal of this, of the old brick. Miss Ingalls and Miss Phelps took care of the upper levels, which were the older kids on the upper. This was a two story building. And Miss Anderson, Miss Cross, Miss Hutchinson, and Miss Green were in charge of the students on the lower level. There were total number of students in that building at that. There were 350 students. And you look at and think, you put pictures of that building. And by the way, the building is still there, portions of it today. It's where Bergeron's men's shop was, where Susie's, I believe Susie, right? Still is Susie's here. That is the old brick. Its second level's gone. It got wiped out after the uh, hurricane of 38. It got really damaged, and the Bergeron just took that second story off. But that is the old brick. There were 116 kids on the upper story, and there were 230 kids on the lower story. And these kids by 1848, the teachers that were in that building, and I've seen many articles through the years, they realized they had it the toughest. Just like today, folks, not much different in schools today when they say the teachers that teach in the, what today we call the urban school districts. They often say even today that they're the teachers that really have to work hard in urban school districts because these Young kids often come from disadvantaged situations, difficult situations in their family homes, a little rougher, and you know, you gotta, just like today, when you have teachers going to really hard urban schools, and you know, I'm gonna be more than a teacher here, I have to, you know, it's gonna be a tough go, but these are the teachers that really dedicate. You think of the teachers that went into that school, and they knew, because truancy was the toughest issue back at the old brick, because a lot of these children, ultimately, although, the whole issue, the reason National Manufacturing did what they did here was to make sure we will not do child labor. We will never do this and create this god-awful situation in America. I have many articles I found by the 1860s and 70s. You had children working in the mills that were 11 and 12 years old. And they were truants and they wouldn't go to school and so it was a... But just like today, a lot of the children had to do that so their families could survive and live and eat. 
and the parents would let their children go into those mills. And they did do it. Now the old brick, again, the whole point of this was, this is going to be a planned industrial city. It's, not, it's going to be civilized, humane, and that's why the school was there. I actually found an interesting record from a uh, work that was done, a WPA project in the 1930s. It's at the National Public Library. A gentleman had done it on the public schools. And he uh, apparently went in. By the way, the records, the company records of the National Manufacturing Company are all down at Harvard University. Is it the Stoughton Library? I'm forgetting the library. Darn it. Which library is the? But the original record, they're there. They saved them when the mills went out. And if you ever want to do something interesting for a day or two, go down to Harvard the library, and you have to call in advance, and they have boxes and boxes of, it's extraordinary. If you really get into those records, because they kept meticulous records, it's amazing what you find. This gentleman found this back in the 30s re re uh, with regard to the school, and this was District 9. The school district here was the newest district in Nashua. Uh, at a meeting Holden at the store chamber of the Nashua Manufacturing Company, Monday evening, the 13th of June, 1825. This is before even the first mill building went up. This is when they were just laying all this out, the grid, no mill buildings yet. So by 1820, which shows you it was a part of the original plan of the manufacturing company, not the town. So the meeting evening, 13th of June, 1825, for the purpose of making arrangements for the school of the present season in District 9 that was set off at the last annual March meeting embracing the lands belonging to the Nashua Manufacturing Company on the south side of the Nashua River. And they voted to adjourn this meeting to the first Saturday in August next at the new schoolhouse at Early Candlelight. So they were basically saying they're going to build this school very fast. Within like a month or so, they're going to get that thing up. And they're literally saying, we're going to meet at the new, I don't know if they built it that fast in the end, but they were going to have their next meeting right at the school. It wasn't on West Pearl Street at that time, though. I'm not exactly sure where it was. There's a good research project for some good Nashuan here, where it originally was, because in 1833, we have building moved. 1833, $35.25 was the cost to move the building. Picture moving an entire brick building for $35.25. <laughs> to move the building to its present site on West Pearl Street at Elm Street, property of the National Manufacturing Company until 1837 when the town appropriated, the town took it over in 1837. So that building was moved there in 1833. I'd love to know where it was probably originally closer to the mills themselves, closer to Factory Street. All right, so, so the bottom line is now, this area is really happening now and becoming, okay? It's kicking in. And so a kind of fun thing to do at this point, you can go into the old city directories and you can do two things. You can either sit there, and there were so few people, you can go, they'd give the names of the folks living, you know, where they lived. They'd give the house and they'd actually list where they worked and what their profession was, where they, which is really fascinating. To do. And there's so few people, you can actually go through the page after page of the directory and just find West Pearl Street. Just find who was living on West Pearl Street. What were their names? Where did they work? What were they doing? Or you can go to the business directory section of these things and you just find out what businesses were there on West Pearl Street. You go through. I just did the businesses. <laughs> I don't have like the time I used to have when I was living here where I would live in the library for four days, you know, and just <laughs> go nuts and do it all. But I'll give you a quick, so let's jump now ahead about 15 years, 1864. Because if you by that time, the place is rolling, businesses are coming in. So I'll give you a quick. And by the way, the way they described what West Pearl Street was in 1864 in the directory, because they'd always give a quick description of each street, where it went to, from where to where, and they described West Pearl Street from Main Street to the Nashua Company Canal. And that's the thing, folks, was we look at West Pearl Street today, you only look at the remnant of basically one-third of that street. The remaining two-thirds were obliterated, truly obliterated, wiped out, wiped off the face of the earth during urban renewal. Like it was never there. You never know it was there. But West Pearl again, so starts right here at Maine and goes all the way out. And there's the canal. So they described it as going to the canal in 1864. And I feel bad because this whole time, 
I actually had good pictures to show, and I completely forgot to show them. Right? That was just you know a later shot from a different perspective. Here is Main Street, heading south. Okay, and let me make sure I'm not doing this wrong. And West Pearl Street cuts right on down, all the way down. But you can see very much that Main Street and the Pearls, there was just no Pearl Street, was sort of, it was the main cross of the grid. Hollis Street really came after and developed after they laid out. Oh, by the way, I forgot. Wow, one of the most important things. The other reason these gentlemen decided most likely to build that house, a hotel there, in 1847 was the following year, 1848, what goes charter and goes in operation, the Worcester and Nashua Railroad Line, connecting Nashua all the way to the city of Worcester, Massachusetts, and then ultimately from Worcester right down through Connecticut to Long Island Sound to New York City. And there are great articles from them, I, would, I didn't include that, but saying Nashua was, this is when Nashua knew. We, we're, we're, this place is now going to be a really, because they would literally say, we have direct connection out of New York City from Nashua. Hop on that train and go right to, so these again, gentlemen knew they were the great enterprise and dust. They knew that railroad now is being built, new passenger station up here. Uh, the Wilton Railroads completed in 1845. Concord Railroad, 1840, 1842. This one, 1848, all of a sudden, you have five major railroads all crossing right here. So these gentlemen knew, build a hotel. We're going to just make a ton of money, everyone. This is going to be, and they were right, and it did. And this is, so, you know, what happened, how it went down. So, because Nashua really is a railroad city, and a lot of people don't really think of Nashua. Na what actually made this city, truly, were the railroads. I will stand by that statement as much as, as much as, if not more, than Nashua Manufacturing and the, the, manu the textile mills. It were the railroads. That they we had ultimately six major railroad lines all meeting right here crossing in Nashua. That's amazing. And I know today we're trying to become a railroad city again. <laughs> right, Mr. Williams? And Chris. Which really, really should happen, guys, you know? To have passenger service. And we're, by the way, I don't mean to die, but we're doing this right now in Auburn and Lewiston. We're fighting hard. We're going to be getting our passenger rail connection, hopefully up from Portland and through Auburn all the way up to Montreal. This is happening everywhere, folks. Thank God, finally. And Nashua, I know, is going to be on the vanguard as it always has been. So I don't mean to divide that, but <laughs> railroads. Yay. Anyway, see, I, I'm, not, I'm not supposed to be controversial today. I'll try not to be. All right. 1864, what businesses, I just did a quick sample of uh, what businesses are on there now by 1864 on West Pearl Street. SF Wright, livery stable, corner of Main and Pearl Street. This was the big livery stable that was right behind and attached to the Tremont House. Every one of these, just like today, guys, when you build a nice big hotel, first thing you know, you lots of a big parking lot. Because all the people coming here have to, okay, they need a, a terminal to put the, well, every hotel in all these places, every one of them, Indian House, Washington House, all of them had to have, they had the great livery stables, the Leighton House, ultimately Leighton Hotel, all these great massive livery stables right affixed, because much like today, they needed parking in downtown too, right? Just like we need parking today, nothing new. So the big, so SF Wright is running that livery stable at 120 West Pearl Street, MR Buxton, West Indian goods, which was the little New England secret way of saying, we have booze, <laughs> rum. They wouldn't say rum or alcohol, they'd say West Indian, uh, West India goods, which meant rum. And groceries, flour, grain, wood, fruit, cigars, Buxton. Otis Wright had a billiard hall in the, temp in the Pearl Street house. There was always a great billiard hall and billiard parlor in the building which just made it all the rage, you know. Uh, 112 West Pearl Street, Charles Holman, Holman Stadium, started his confectionery business on West Pearl Street. He later moved up on the Main Street, uh, down by uh, East and West Hollis Street, but this is the ch same Charles Holman, and when he died, 
left the money to build Holman Stadium and many other things. E.P. Chase, boot and shoemaker at 80 West Pearl Street, E.G. Hutchins, meat and provisions, uh, George J. Little, again, West India, goods and groceries, corner of Pearl and Maine. So what you're getting at here is, it's, it's, it's more of these businesses that cater to the local neighborhood, very local needs, not the big business blocks on Main Street. And I think West Pearl Street has always had that, I think, very special culture and quality to it that it's all, I remember actually when I started working here, uh, I forget who said it to me in West Pearl, one of the merchants back, I'm going back now almost 20 years, said, well, West Pearl Street, we call it Family Street. I forget who said that to me. Was it you, Mr. Gage? No. Someone said that to me 20 years ago. <laughs> but they said, remember that. West Pearl Street is Family Street. And I think the point is, you go through history, there are always these great, unique, small businesses that really catered to people's sort of everyday lives and the families and their growing families and things. Um, so that's what was going in 1864. Now we jump up, let's jump about 11, uh, 20 years ahead, 1885. They describe West Pearl Street as going from Main Street to South Pine Street. Da -da -da. Uh, uh, I, just, I just got lost here. Where am I looking at? <laughs> oh, there we go. Main Street, West Pearl, Tremont. You see the big block attached to it there, which is long gone. Another one, stables. This is the Parkinson, Parkinson building, which stood there just about almost at the time uh, Herb Miller built Miller's. That building was there up until the early 50s. It was beat to hell, but it was there. And you can see here on the south side of West Pearl, you never had big blocks. It was always these individual. <laughs> You know, small homes that were either converted into small commercial, but you never had big block type things here. But you even see here at this time, they were just small houses. And actually, that is the old brick. I believe it's there, although that looks more like it to me, but that's where it should be. But you get a sense visually of it there. And uh, here, okay, there we are, Tremont West Pearl Street going down. There you see the Tremont block where the commercial things were, stables in the back and again you see there were really homes and blocks but it was this I'm sorry did I just I, I'm on the wrong street that's high see it threw me which throws people this is the old Universalist Church which stood in the corner of High Street uh, yes High Street and Main Merchants Block it always throws me right they look because this did have a cupola back then but again, there it is Tremont Block and there you see this which is a survivor today this is where, so today, uh, like where the city room is. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, Vivian's being in there when I was here. Yeah. Vivian, oh God. <laughs> now, that is a great survivor. I believe this was the Woodward block. And this is neat, because if you go by and look at it, it has its original mansard roof. Mm -hmm. And you can age that building architecturally, just like the Leighton Hotel, the mansard roofs were all the rage in the late 1870s, 18, early 1880s. So that's a great survivor. And further down. Is that, is that it, Alan, in this picture down below? Is that, that's it, uh, it is, yeah. That should be, you should be sort of seeing the front of it a little I bit. I mean, like the whole thing. Like oh. The whole, this is the parking lot. Oh. Is this the side of it, the big white thing you see in TD Bank parking lot? Where the oh, that's the back of the. Oh, actually, I'm sorry, I just right oriented myself. Yeah, you're looking from Main Street right there. Yeah, that's yeah. the big opening, and that big opening now, which you know goes back and is sort of behind Martha's yeah. Exchange and all that. Uh, but that is where the original, so what they called the Tremont Block, which was the more commercial yeah. part. Of the, it's, and then the stables and all this stuff were back there in the hall. Uh, just do quickly. This this blew my mind when it was forwarded to me. And whose image was this? If you oh, could. Cool. Say, say louder. His name is Mike Loray. Mike Loray. This is a stereoscope. I never, I've never seen this image before it was sent to me a few weeks ago and it really blew my mind. This is the oldest image I've ever seen of the uh, Pearl Street house. But the, in stereoscope, right, you'd look at it with that's why it's a double thing. Okay. But there you see the original. And it was, um, it was Greek revival architecturally, which is what, well, actually was getting a little out of it by the late 1840s, but still doing, but definitely a Greek revival portico, columns, little balconies on each of the floors, little wrought iron balconies, 
very similar to what was done in the old city hall. Actually, very similar architecture to the original city hall building, which was built in 1842. Mm -hmm. But you get a real, no merchant's block there yet. Martha's Exchange building in there. Really amazing uh, image. Yeah, and this freaky little water trough, which looks like it's actually made out of wood. But there it is. And there were postcards in later years of the great formal uh, stone trough thing, which I've never found the history of where, and I'd love to find out what happened to that when it was there. But there was obviously always a spot there for watering the horses. Similar, same thing as today's gas stations for our cars. <laughs> and there's always a gas station near a hotel, right? And there's another, a really great early shot showing again the really strong Greek Revival architecture. Whenever you see that great uh, pediment, Greek Revi all very Greek Revival. But it was a beautiful building, and you see how the lower levels were the great step down, yeah. which people just think is so cool today in Back Bay in Boston, you know, <laughs> or on Newberry Street. And they have, right, this is the coolest places are, and you step down in these cool old things which we still have in the Leighton building, the Leighton house, a couple of them survive. Do you think that if the facade is different, which one is later and earlier, do you know? Oh. No, the, no, no, not that, but the one below. The oh, that's much mansion. later, yeah. Okay, so that's later than that. And there it is later on, and I'll get to that in a second, when the uh, so-called balcony, and they called it a balcony, yeah. was built. And they, but you get a sense of it changing. Very big and abundant. Oh, God, there were many pictures of Nash. They would decorate these buildings for occasion. They would really go all out. 50th and 03, right? 50th. It probably was in 1903. Amazing building, which I have never truly understood the history of, which still exists right there. Alex Schuster, John Kutis owns that in the back. Uh, Richardsonian Romanesque, built in the 1890s. There's all the really other great blocks on West Pearl Street didn't come until the 1890s. I'm sorry? No, 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 that was not Miller's. But that one deserves some good research, which I've never, what happened there? No, no, okay, I guess that's all I made then. Okay, all right, now quickly, 1885. Let's go, who's on Tremont Street? Uh, Tremont House is there and they have Gilman Scripture who was the proprietor then. Then they describe the Tremont Block, which they describe as being under the Tremont House. This is where all the commercial businesses were. They did this con. The Yan old Yankees were so smart back then, and that's what we do now when we say good development, we should do what we call now as plan to say mixed use. We want mixed use development. Like it's this great new thing. We've like, you know, it's like, God. They knew. No building would be, especially church buildings. The Baptist church building would still exist, the corner of Franklin and Main Grace Fellowship now. Even the city, old city hall building in 1842. Church buildings. Um, municipal buildings, everything, they would always have on the ground level space for mercantile and businesses. And then the churches would be upstairs in the halls, or the city it would be upstairs. They always did mixed uses in these buildings because these old Yankees, were too, they were smart. They understood how you make an asset perform. And we lost that after the 1960s, when we, and, and we did zoning where, you know, we have zoning now. And zoning is going to solve all our problems, you see, because zoning is going to separate and isolate and segregate all these uses. So, you know, church buildings should be over here in church zones, and schools should be in the school zones, and then we'll have businesses and the commercials, and everything should be all separated and spread out, you see. So you can't walk to anything anymore because everything is so separate and sprawled out. So now I need my car. And you need your car to get to because it's all spread out. So we need to build surface parking lots around everything, you see. And then everything just tears apart. And now I'm sorry I'm doing my new urbanist jag. I won't do that. <laughs> but the point is, history teaches us. And I love the fact that they did the best development before they were planning boards and zoning boards, and smart aleck planners like me, and all these did this whole stuff to really, you know, to, to help guide the right way to do it is all wrong. We're finally going back to this, thank goodness, and doing it the right way. Tremont Hall, as it's called, was in the rear of the Tremont House, and it was a full hall in the stable also. Then you have uh, Woodward's Block, West Pearl Street, which you talked about. Then on West Pearl Street, 1885, you have A. Lafave at 10 
West Pearl Street, who was a baker. You have Nichols Orchestra, uh, the corner of Maine and West Pearl, in the business directory. You had orchestras there. Uh, the billiard hall, of course, Temple House. Boarding and baiting staples. I never heard it referred to that as a baiting, B-A-I-T, just like bait, like fishing bait. Boarding and baiting staples. Jay Wilkins and son, rear of the Tremont House and Indian House. And it was this Wilkins family that was really there the longest time that ran that famous stable behind the Tremont House. Cigars and tobacco, you had Barney Brothers at 87 West Pearl. LPA Lavoie in Woodward's Block selling cigars and tobacco. And then you have AL Vining in number two Tremont Block. In the Tremont Block itself, you had the famous Vining's Restaurant. And I guess this was the most famous restaurant, uh, you know, at this part of the city at the time. And they said in their great little advertisement, they described themselves as being the second door down from Main Street, you know. <laughs> So right in the back of this building, and their ad just says, claims, meals served to order all hours. So they're basically saying, come anytime you want, we'll give you what you want. Fruits, nuts, confectionery, pastries, cakes to boot. Confectioners, F.A. Garland's in the Woodward Block on West Pearl Street in 1885. Uh, Mrs. J.H. Knapp at 97 West Pearl Street has a dining room, as she describes it, her own little dining room. You have a fish dealer, C.H. Baker, in the Tremont block. Everything was in the Tremont block. You had everything from fish dealers to billiard halls to a guy selling uh, pipes and plumbing fixtures. All mixed together. Grocers on West Pearl Street in 1887. This is the funny one. So it, it exploded as, a gro as the grocery street by 1885. You have Barker Brothers at 120 West Pearl Street. This is all grocers. Barney Brothers at 87 West Pearl Street. A.J. Blood and Company at 94 West Pearl Street. Josiah Cook at 128 West Pearl Street. Patrick Gaffney, 157 West Pearl. Asa Jackwith, 126 West Pearl. George Little, 89 West Pearl. Edward McCabe, 144 West Pearl. Benjamin Woods, uh, West Pearl and Chestnut. They're all grocers. Those addresses are really right on top of each other. Look at the variety people had back then on just this one little street. You could walk down, you know, which grocery do you want to go to? And they were all there together, packed in, but all doing their own thing. And then, of course, you have by this point hairdressers. And I love the hairdressers. In 1885, you have Ingalls and Sprague, who was where? In the Tremont House. So in Tremont House, you can stay there, you can shoot pool, you can get your hair done. And you can have a nice meal at A.L. Vining's restaurant, and what a, what a scene. Also, you have Louis Louis Le Tendre, and this is the Quebecois, the French king, by 1885. He's at 140 West Pearl Street. He's a hairdresser. And you have Theophile, am I pronouncing that right? Theophile Levesque? Theophile Levesque at 126 West Pearl Street, who are all hairdressers. And we have a lot of great hairdressers today on West Pearl Street, right? Now, 1874, big article, change in the Tremont House. And by the way, when does it transform from Pearl Street House to the Tremont House? My, I believe it's 1864, right about then, from my research. And I think Frank Mooney found something, right, saying 1864. I thought it was like 1868, but it's right in there, right around the Civil War. I don't know exactly who or why, more research to be done, change it from, let's not call this the Pearl Street House anymore. Let's call it the Tremont Hotel. What is the difference to you all? Would you rather stay at a place called the Pearl Street House? Or would you rather stay at a place called the Tremont Hotel? I make a joke, but it is, so you very, you know, I'm sure it was done very thought, just like today, man. It's good branding. And, good, and I think they were maybe saying, we want to uh, create a more upscale, a more, you know, prestigious type of experience or offer. And why Tremont, folks? Tremont, the word Tremont has nothing whatsoever to do with this location. It's Boston. You think Tremont. This is where the tre original Tremont Hotel and Tremont Church. And, Tremont, three mount, the three mounts. There is no Tremont in Nashua. I think it probably was, I mean, the, the deep, deep connections between Nashua and Boston, I can't even describe to you. And I know a lot of people don't like this up here in New Hampshire and Nashua, and I'm in Boston. 
Boston money and Boston commercial relation built this city. We we're always connected, Boston and Nashua. And I think it was probably certain individuals at the hotel at this time who were just like, and by the way, there were more and more people from Boston coming up here and from long distance to this place. And I think, again, they just wanted to really give it a new thing. Okay. But 1870, October 1st, 1874, change in the Tremont House, Nashua Telegraph. Colonel Gilman's scripture, favorably known as one of the most popular and successful landlords in the state, has purchased of Samuel Dresser of Lowell, one of my Lowell guys ended up buying the Tremont House and owning it, Lowell, the entire property of the Tremont House, paying the sum of $28,500 in 1874. Now they built the thing in 1847 for 12,000, so good return on investment, it seems to me. It is Mr. Scripture's intention greatly to improve the property, and the improvements will include a new and beautiful balcony in place of the present portico. And the portico is just a little Greek over the doorway. And an extension of the awning, they call it an awning, which is interesting, to correspond with that in front of the Merchants Exchange Block, which went up in 1873 just a year before this. The public will be glad to welcome the landlord and landlady of the old Indian House Hotel back to positions from which they parted with them with regret. So a little intrigue there, a little soap opera, like, ooh, what happened to Gilman? But he's back. Takes over, buys this in 1870, and really upgrades the whole thing, Gilman Scripture. And he was a very well-known man in Nashua. Three years later, the tremor becomes a... Uh, the notoriety ramps up big time because President Rutherford B. Haynes is coming to Nashua, you see. Then he comes to Nashua. They have him here. Of course, comes on the railroad. And he stays at the home of uh, Charles Williams. Charles Williams was one of the brothers who owned the Williams Foundry, which was down uh, Temple Street in that area, of great famous foundry. But they decide to have a glorious banquet for the president here in Nashua. To that time, the only other president that had really been here was Andrew Jackson, who stayed at the Washington House Hotel. The corner, that was in 1833. So picture, man, in terms of branding and upscaling, it's like you have the president. Now you can say, president stay at, you know? I mean, man, there you go. They had the grand banquet here at the uh, Tremont Hotel for the president. And there are great articles and stories written about it. They went all out, of course. So it's, uh, and it's he, up to that time, he was known as the president that stayed the longest in Nashua. <laughs> all the other presidents that came in, this was before the primary guys and all this stuff went. Now we're used to this stuff, right? It's like, oh yeah, another president can. Back then it was a big deal. All the other presidents that came through were sort of blew in and blew out on the rail. They either spoke from the railroad cars at the <laughs> station or just zoop, zoop, you know, he stayed for a while. So that lent great prestige, you know, to it. Uh, okay. Uh, and then I have a great little advertisement from 1886 when the place is really going up. So this is like 10 years later, and they just described in this ad, the Tremont House, the largest and finest hotel in Nashua now, they claim it to be. This hotel is located in the center of business. So here we go on 40 years from where they said, right, this was no man's land where they were just junk and rubbish and mud and scows. Now it is the center of business. So what I say is these gentlemen did their work well over the 40 years. They wanted to develop this and, you know, they really did it. Uh, near the depots and has been thoroughly renovated, repaired, refitted, and refurnished. Okay. You know? And it, it's first class in all its appointments, arrangements, and management. Electric light wires have been recently put in. Whoa! <laughs> and the terms, how much does it cost in 1886 to stay in the finest hotel in that and the end all place? You can either have a room for $2 a day, or if you really missed a big, I miss big, it's $2.50 a day, $2.50. <laughs> Pretty nice. <laughs> I'll skip that one. <laughs> then later you see on postcards and all stuff them calling this place Tremont Square. 
When does it become Tremont Square? And why would they name this Tremont Square? It's not known as Tremont Square anymore. Although I remember when I was here, I, I did this big push to say, we've got to call this place Tremont Square again, you know? It just sounds cool, yeah. right? I'll meet you at Tremont Square out at the Sidewalk Cafe. Well, where's that? It was designated or, you know, named Tremont Square in about 1894. Why? Because, uh, oh, and you see these nice little rail trolley tracks in the street, of course. The horse railway was introduced in Nashua in like 1886, and then the electric trolley lines like in 1892 or so. But in 1894, the Lowell, there's Lowell, my Lowell, I love it, Lowell's always, the Lowell and Suburban Trolley Company takes over the whole system, sort of. And now out-of-town trolleys, in other words, Nashua is now connected with Lowell and other cities. So now out-of-town people are coming in on the trolley, and the trolley needed a terminus. A like, what are we going to call this place where this trolley is, you know, coming to here? And it was the trolley that we're going to call it Tremont Square. So it was a result of the trolley lines coming, and, you know, we gotta, it has to be dubbed the great place. So therefore, and maybe that's after the trolleys are gone, long gone and everything, right, folks? when they dug up through that why call this Tremont Square anymore and it just passed. No one today, if you walked up and said, if you're out and said, what is this place called? People say, I don't know, I'm at the corner of West Pearl, I don't know, Tremont Square. 1903 uh, directory, uh, they described the Tremont House as the commercial man's home. <laughs> Which shows you this transition is happening now, because now it's really just sort of and by the way, I didn't get into which I couldn't, it'd be endless, and I'm already going, I know too long, and I'm going to try to wrap this up now. Uh, if you ask, well, who stayed at the Tremont Hotel during those glory days? The answer is everyone. Nashua was such a dynamic city in the last half of the 19th century. You had constant performing acts coming in. They'd be performing at the Franklin Opera House. We had many halls. There were shows. There were, so all these people coming in doing this would have to stay in these hotels. Business clients, business agents, people were coming up from Boston actually just to stay. So it's, it's endless. Everyone stayed at the Trump, and it really was the premier place. Of course, the Leighton Hotel was built in 1881, and that was really the competition to this one. These were the two best. And yes, the Leighton House, believe it or not, one time was the best of the best. Thank God it survives, though. It's an amazing survivor. That, and it's amazing that it has survived. What's gone on in the Leighton Hotel? I mean, no, I'm, you know, it's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. It survived. OK. Now, I just jump up to this now quickly. So. The Second National Bank. Second National Bank is formed in 1875. Actually, let me, I'll do it this way. The 1903, now they're just calling it the commercial man's home. In 1916, uh, Lester Thurber, the Thurber family of Nashua. Lester Thurber acquires the Tremont hotel. He acquires it, and I got a little kind of, I don't know, a little thing with the research I did. Uh, he acquires it supposedly as a representative of the Second National Bank of Nashua. Although I looked at some of the records of the Second National Bank from another work that was done actually by Joe Seiki, great Joe Seiki, a work he did on the Second National Bank, which is in the library, the thing where it just describes Lester Thurber, that the Second National Bank acquired the building of property from Lester Thurber. So I'm a little unsure as did he buy it as part of the bank or did he just because he Lester was the board of directors of the bank. So I don't know how that all worked but some there was a real estate transaction happened there. That is in 1916. In 1918 if you go to the Nashua City Directory that's the first year there is no listing and no such thing as the Tremont Hotel. Gone. So 1917, for all practical purposes, was, that's it. The show's over. 1918, no listing. 
And in 1919, I find a fascinating article from the National Telegraph entitled, May Use Tremont House for Builders. I'm like, what is that? And they, uh, the National Manufacturing Company is building one of their big new woolen mills uh, out further out in the mill yard, actually being done by Stone and Webster, one of the famous Boston engineering firms. <laughs> that fascinated me itself, it's Stone and Webster. And they're bringing up to build this massive new textile mill building uh, they need to bring up 350 to 400 laborers just to build this new mill building up to Nashua. And uh, the company contracts with the Second National Bank, these folks that own this in 1919, and they're going to occupy it as a lodging and boarding house for construction forces to be engaged for the proposed new woolen mill in Nashua Manufacturing Company. So at this point, they're using it just as a rough boarding house for workers and stuff. So the glory and all this now is, and it's, it's done. It's, it's days are numbered now. That's it. They're just going to beat the hell out of the thing, and that's it. I'll do one last thing on the Tremont House, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And I heard this story when I was here, and I remember I'd tell it when I was out there in tours, but I had it wrong, because someone told it to me wrong. Someone described to me as there were a group of businessmen from New England, went to the White House, we met with the president, and this one guy. It wasn't that at all. I found the... <laughs> <laughs> All right, it was actually a gentleman by the name of Howard F. Hammer, H-A-M-M-A-R, of, of Nashua. I don't know if that, I never heard that family name, but. And Howard Hammer, in 1936, was the president of the Young Men's Democratic Clubs of New Hampshire. Good young Democrat. And what he did, he went to the great national convention of the Young Men's Club the National Convention, which was in Baltimore, Maryland. And it just so happened in 19, April of 36, Franklin Delano Roosevelt is there, of course, at the Young Men's Democratic Club, right? He's a good Democratic, great Democratic president, and he's meeting all of them. And Henry uh, uh, Howard Hammer describes then, he is shaking hands with the president, as he's, the president meeting all these other guys from all over the country, and Howard is wearing his little official badge, as we all do at conferences, you know, or who are we from? And his happens to say Nashua, New Hampshire. And he leans over, it's shake president, you know, nice to meet you. And the president, as he says here, president looks at his badge and says, so, should I do my Franklin Delano Roosevelt impression? <laughs> so, yeah, right, all right. So, you're from Nashua. And, he's, and Roosevelt says, I know your city well. I used to go to school nearby. And what he was referring to was the Groton School. He attended the Groton School as a young man. That was like in 1896 when he was at the Groton School. And then Hammer goes on to say, then with a straight smile, he asked, is the Tremont House still standing? In 1936, and of course, <laughs> gone. But that's the famous, and I would tell him, uh, so you picture a young Franklin Delano Roosevelt, right? It's 1896, he's 17 years old, 18. Have any of you ever been down to uh, the Groton School, right down in Groton? It's pretty quiet in Groton down there now. Picture what it was like in 1896 out in Groton. And you had all these very, the wealthiest of, okay, young men from the wealthiest families in New England. And you can picture these young guys, they're 17, 18, 9, they're going down there. They had to get out just like all of us did, when young guys. I know what I did when I was 17, 18, 19. <laughs> <laughs> They'd get on the train. Of course, the train, the Worcester and Nashville Railroad, cut sort of right through on Groton, so they would have, in air actually, they would have hopped right on the railroad there. Groton boys would have come up here, got off at the Worcester Depot, come down, and had one hell of a time at the Tremont House. And I think it's in the Nashua, the history book, the Nashua Experience. No, the one that was done by Shepard. I forget oh, the title the of that. Nashua, uh, the no, so, time, uh, Testing Time. A Testing Time. Oh, testing Time. That was Shepard. No. Well, whoever did that, he had a little thing in it too. And I remember he phrased it saying that Roosevelt said he had the best days of his life was spent swanking around the Tremont Hotel. <laughs> and I always love that term. <laughs> swanking around, right? So anyway, 
it was a special place to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, you know? All right. We now go into the wrap up here. Second National Bank's chart in 1875. Uh, it's Jeremiah White that is the man that founds this bank. Jeremiah White, is a man. he was known as the richest man in Nashua. Very few people know this guy's name or even know who he was. Uh, he lives, actually, his house is still there at the corner of East Pearl and uh, Cottage Street. The law office is now of um, uh, McAllister. No, um, Morgan no, the one right after it. Forgetting the name. But that legal, this was Jeremiah White's home. He lived right there. Amazing guy. He is the man. He came to Nashville as a young man, built a fortune. Another one of these guys just built a fortune in Mercantile. He built the Merchants Exchange building in 1872-73. He puts his shop right in, you know, in that building right from the get-go. And then in 1875, a few years later, he launches the Second National Bank with a lot of other influential guys. I won't get into names here. The Second National Bank immediately locates its first location is right in the Merchant's Block, where, right where my good friend Phil Sconchus's jewelry shop is now. That was the original location. They then moved out of there a couple of years and moved into a different location in that block, but they were always right there. This was his building and all. Jeremiah White, fascinating guy. I'll just do one quick one. Uh, start of the Civil War, uh, uh, Fort, Fort Sumner. Sumter? Sumner? I always get them confused. Sumter, Sumter right? Uh, they're getting ready to bomb this, the Confederate, right down there. They're going to start the Civil War. By the way, our great Nashua guy, General uh, John Gray Foster, is second in command of the fort when this is happening. It just so happens Jeremiah White of Nashua happens to be in Charleston, South Carolina when all this is happening. Uh, this guy is such a smooth operator, he convinces the Confederates, like literally a day or two before they're going to bomb this fort. He said, can I go out to the fort and visit my friend, you know, John Foster from Nashua? <laughs> And he's a Yankee from, you know, New Hampshire. And these guys would have said, yeah, you know, okay. and they, he's like, they're like, okay, sure. They let him. They get a boat. They chug him out to the fort. This is like two days before they bomb this place. And he goes and has this lovely visit with his friend, Johnny Foster. So these are the last, two, you know, and he gets out in the boat. He gets with them, and they bomb the hell out of the fort. But he was right there. So I'm fascinated that we had two Nashua guys right at that point of history, which is fascinating. Anyway. Uh, I gotta move. This is just okay. It. They form the bank. The bank does great. Uh, he's the president. Fred Estabrook becomes president after him. Estabrook Anderson Shoe Factory building. Yeah, back on it. All these guys are in tonight. They're, they're the bank that funded that. Fine. Uh, Lester Thurber becomes third president. He is the president at that time of the White Mountain Freezer Company. Frank Mooney knows all about that. Um, and they decide finally, though, we're going to build a new bank building. Obviously, they have their eyes on the building right next to where they've always been in the Merchant's Block. They see the Tremont House. Lester Thurber gets in there in 1916, buys the thing. They keep it for a few years. And then in 19, I still, I've tried for life me to find it. I know there's a great article out there somewhere showing the demolition of the Tremont House. I just, I try, I can't find, I will find it someday, but they demol I think they demolished it in late 1921, early 1922, and then they decide we're going to build this great new bank building there. They build this great new bank building. It's completed in February of 1924, and this bank building is epic, and it's, boy, I often ask people, I know everyone drives by in their car fast, you probably won't give it a second look, stop someday. Just really, get on the other side of the street. Look at actually the West Pearl Street elevation of the building. It is the great Greek, it's a Greek temple. It's a Grecian temple building in, in every you know, aspect of it. The architectural firm they hired to build was Mowbray and Uffinger. They were the premier bank architects in America at that time. They built over 400 bank buildings in America. You know, during that time, the teens and 20s. So these guys, look, these guys had the means to do the world's best, and they did it. By the way, a year before, right across the street, they built the Indian Head Bank building just a year before. So these two bank buildings go up at about the same time. And they were almost, well, they were. They were always just like being competing with each other. And look at those two buildings and say, who outdid who? You know, pretty grand stuff. Uh, the bank building was built as all bank buildings were built back then, not like today. Those buildings, the architecture spoke to make you feel like this is the safest place I can put anything I have of value. They were built to make you feel 
That's why they would build these monumental buildings that just had mass to them and impenetrable and gave you the feeling that these are fortresses, these are you know, temples of, and th that architecture had everything to do with being able to open new accounts and attract those and make them you know, good customers. Just the way the bank buildings look was so important. Today it's that, you know, my God, wherever, build whatever so cars can just whip in and out of it and you know, it doesn't matter. Uh, the cornerstone of that building that's there today what came from Deer Island, Boston. Massive three by four foot block of granite that for whatever reason they pulled out, you know, Deer Island out in Boston Harbor. I have an article of just the bank doors, not the vault, just the front doors of it which are gone now. They brought them in by railroad. They, I forget what the, the number, it was an, a, an absurd number that just the doors in the front of the bank doors weighed, I think it was in excess of seven tons. It was like an absurd number of tons, just the doors in the front of the bank. Why? To make you feel and know that nothing can penetrate this fortress. So they would do this type of pay ungodly amounts of money just to make you feel and know. When those doors are locked at night, <coughs> Okay? An army couldn't get into this place. Or if it burned, it would never catch on fire. Not in the vaults they built. Amazing. The bank, that bank building is just extraordinary. And it's a great survivor. I don't like what they've done with the facade of it. At least they... I won't get into that, but... They should redo the front facade of that building someday. You'd really see that architecture come out strong. Uh, okay. Now... I'll do this quickly. Some last... And I just got to do the Greek coffee houses real fast because it's just a riot. What time is it right now? I want to know how bad am I doing here? No. I'm sorry. All right, I'll do this. I'll wrap this. You're not going to ask for a refund after? No? All right. All right, I do two, what, two quick cool ones. The Great White Way on Pearl Street. The Great White Way? What is this? Electricity, bring electricity and lights onto these downtown main streets was a huge thing. The first electric lights came on the main street. They lit it up in uh, 19, um, 1913 or so early. And this, I can't even tell you. Look at the National Telegraph and if you want to see headlines. And there was massive celebrations, true city celebrations. We have electric lights on the street, which again shows that this is the city, okay, that is uh, most important. The folks on, and it shows some about West Pearl Street. No other side streets has lights on it, but the merchants on West Pearl Street in 1913 just said, we are to have light. We are as good as Main Street. I remember folks on West Pearl saying it to me when I was working as a doctor, saying, hey, don't spend all your time on Main Street. West Pearl Street is just as good. <laughs> right. I think he was one of those ones that told me that 19 years ago when I came in. Remember that, Alan. All right. Don't spend all your time up there. All right. October 16th, 1913, and I love the title back then, it just says, West Pearl Street, gay, next Saturday night. <laughs> and of course, yes, happiness, <laughs> euphoria. And they describe private venture of the store men, I love they call them the store men, of West Pearl Street, with which the city has no hand. They wanted to make a real point, this city isn't doing this for us, forget them. We'll do this ourselves, you know. The, the owners of all the business and nights on, up and down West, but they said, we're going to pay for this ourselves. We're going to light up West Pearl Street with lights of our commercial thing. And they uh, did it. The, the weird, not weird, the unique thing is this is when electricity was, and Main Street was electric. They decide we're not going to do electric lights on West Pearl Street. They did gas lamps in 1913. <laughs> Very interesting and peculiar. And they didn't set them up on gas light posts on the street because it wasn't their property. They affixed these to their buildings. In 1913, they described these apertures they put on each of their buildings. They paid for it themselves. And they did it with the Nashua Gas Light Company, which still existed then. And they finally going to have their big, and they have this mass celebration. We're going to light up West Pearl Street this Saturday night in October 1913. They hand out 15,000 flyers in the neighborhood. The thing that I love, it said 15,000 flyers to get everyone there on West Pearl Street that night. And they said 5,000 are written in English, 5,000 written in French, and 5,000 written in Polish. <laughs> no Greek? <laughs> 
which shows you who their market was. All right, that in the neighborhood. And by the way, the Lithuanian neighborhood was up on High Street. That was originally the Irish neighborhood, and oh, all right, and the Polish. Uh, so they do this up. They have this huge. They have a band. They have a whole stage. They have this amazing festival for the night, just like we do festivals. Uh, all the stores are giving out free things, and they said literally in excess of 5,000 people filled West Pearl Street that night that they lit up West Pearl with their gas lights. The one quirky thing I thought was funny, they said one of their most uh, uh, popular things, they did the shirt scramble. Am I going shirt scramble? What is the shirt scramble? Well, one of the owners of one of the, of the men's shops on West Pearl Street went up on the roof of his building with boxes of folded shirts, the thing, and pitched them to the crowd on West Pearl Street. <laughs> it became this mass melee. And they called it the shirt scramble. Oh, <laughs> Wow, man, maybe we should have a shirt scramble festival in downtown Nashville, right? Just wild stuff. All right, I will finish up with the Greek coffee houses quickly because it is a riot. All right. The Greek population came into Nashua late 1890s, turn of the century. It all started off as young men. Only the men came first. This was the same thing I know with the Armenian people and many others from Southern European are coming over. Young men come first. Young men live in boarding houses. Uh, most of the Greek young men, same with the Armenians and others, did not work in the textile mills. They worked in the shoe factories predominantly. Estabrook Anderson, back on Palm Street, was where most of the Greek men and Greeks worked. That's why the church ends up being built on Ash Street, right next door, becomes the epicenter of the Greek neighborhood. That's shoe, shoe factories. So these young men are here, and um, they're living in these houses alone, no women stuff. So they work in the mills all day. They're living in these, and I guarantee you that uh, those Greek men coming as new immigrants were rented out the worst of worst boarding houses. They were probably wretched, horrible places. This is what you get to come home to at night after killing yourself, almost and literally, almost, you know, in shoe mills all day. So they created the coffee houses. And the first one was actually not in West Pearl Street. It was over by Bower Street in like 1905 or so because the Greeks first worked. There was a factory over there. So that was the first coffee house. But then the first coffee house to emerge on West Pearl Street was in 1908. And here come these coffee houses. What is the important, why do they need these coffee houses? Because these were the places after work and all that the young Greek men, they would come and meet and socialize and talk actually serious local issues about what they were going through. They would support each other. They needed, they had no one else. And I guarantee you, they were treated like dirt as all we immigrants were to come to America. As you know, new arrivals always, we got to treat them like dirt first and then they earn the right to be good Americans like all of us. So they could literally escape to these places, be together, have some more, speak Greek together. They would mostly be talking, frankly, about what's going on in the old country, politics, religion. There were horrible things going on with the Ottoman Empire at this time, with the Greek people and the Armenians. So they would get together and talk about what's going on, uh, commiserate with each other, support each other, and other things. So it was an important socio-cultural function, men, Young men mostly, and then the older guys. And it was all about the coffee houses because they were this is where they would drink their coffee, their demitas, right? And their little cups and the coffee. Um, the neat thing about these coffee houses, some of the best stuff was written by John Stellianos in the 1960s because this is when all the coffee houses were almost gone. And he would write some really fascinating stuff, little pieces about, do you remember when, and, and, and this little one actually from FHD around town. It was not Stilianos. Uh, it was Fred Dobbins, was right? Okay. And I love this. So this is 1962. This is Fred Dobbins. West Pearl Street area was known as Greekville by all Nashua. <laughs> we used to haunt the coffee houses, lapping up that strong Turkish coffee, which would take the roof off your tongue. I'm sorry, which would take the roof of your tongue off for a few good reasons, and that was because we were writing sports back 30 years ago, and West Pearl Street was the gathering place of the boxers and wrestlers 
who used to be featured on local cards in those days. Hmm. hmm. Wait, I skipped one thing here I wanted to say. All right. Right, okay. There it is. I'm sorry. And I have a neat little description here that they would describe. The proprietor would place ingredients into a small copper pot having a snout, add water, and boil it over a gas jet while stirring the mixture lightly. I'm talking about now making their coffee. So here's an actual description from the period of how they would make it, which to me is a little gem, uh, while stirring the mixture lightly. When the coffee reached a boiling point, he would let the gas. Powered fire figuratively fed the substance into a cup held in his left hand, or he could raise the small pot almost a foot above the cup, pour it slowly. It would end up with a lot of bubbles and a rich looking appearance. Well, this sounds like the hip espresso joints, right? Now we love going to it. Doing it in Nashua since 1908. And they spoke about that lovingly. The other thing that they would get a kick out of was what the Greeks called the nargile. And the nargile were the old water pipes. So the real scene would be, and they would describe, and it would be the old men, they'd say the old Greek men, the ones do it, they would be sitting there in their coffee house, not only sit at their tables with their coffee, but they'd be in there with their big water, their nargile. There's an Armenian word for it, and I asked my mother, I'm forgetting what they would call that in Armenian, because the old Armenians guys would do that too. What were they smoking in those things, Dean? <laughs> Couldn't have been hash, could it? No one really knows. But it's, and they would give vivid descriptions that on West Pearl Street, and all these coffee shops would have large windows, which they have, and they said the young children, the school children, this was one of their favorite things in the past, and the young, young children would purposely walk up West Pearl Street to go stand in the windows of the car to watch the old Greek men smoking their nagilis. And this was like a real path for the young boys in Nashville that just go, not Greek boys, just the boys say, just go and stand and watch them. And they would be fascinated by this. And they would remember it as they got older and tell stories about it. This is the economics of place. This is, you know, the memorable, meaningful place experiences of all these things. The other things they would do in the Greek coffee houses were what they call karagios, which was a marionette show that they would set up a little white sheet. And this they brought over from Greece. And two of the men would do these little marionettes. And they'd put on these Greek plays and tragic plays of war. And this was the other popular thing they would go and you would watch at the Greek coffee house. I remember articles, I couldn't find them now, by uh, people who would come from Nashville, travelers or folks from Boston. And they would say, up, you know, in the 1920s, you do not have to travel to Greece or Thessalonica or Athens to experience the romance, you know, and mystery of the Oriental, and they call it Oriental, you know, the, Oriental <laughs> or the Far East thing and all thing. All you need to do is to go to West Pearl Street in Nashua, and you are transported to ancient Greece, and here it is, exactly what you would experience. You know, so it became this real mythical, legendary thing, the coffee houses of West Pearl Street. And the other folks that would be attracted to these places were the non-Greek, were the high school athletes. You'd see this in article after article, that not only the old Greek men and the young Greek would be here, but it was the real hangout for the Nashua High School athletes, Irish guys, Lithuanian guys, Polish, the young athletes loved, this is where they would hang out. They just thought it was the coolest thing ever, you see. Just like young jocks say, the cool guys on the teams, you know, they hang out the coolest places, right? The point is that no woman ever set foot in these coffee houses. It was a purely masculine environment. Men, and you can see why they would say the sports writers, the boxers, the wrestlers, the high school athletes. I mean, right, you can, you imagine the testosterone pumping in these plays, these guys, ah. And I guarantee you that they were not just drinking coffee <laughs> in these places. <laughs> one of them had a pool hall or billiards parlor, one of them. There were ultimately six coffee houses. That's what I've invented, that there were six of them on West Pearl Street in different sections. 
and they were just these really beloved places. This was the Greek neighborhood. So uh, the last coffee house went out in 1971. And still Ionis and these guys, you know, right, it lasted that long, which is amazing. Um, but by then, I'm sure it was just sort of a real kind of, you know, hangout. Uh, right, what, the, right, let me, whoop, whoop. Last one. Whoop. Okay, and here we have the last such facility located on West Pearl, was located at West Pearl Street in Vine on the ground floor of a three-story building formerly owned by Peter Pelakas. The building recently was demolished to clear the way for a combination of urban renewal, you see, and public housing projects in the Myrtle Street area. Andrew P. Cortis, one-time coffee house owner, they would discuss right, decisions, policies affecting residents. All these things were debated there. Really important um, place. And right, and I just one of the coffee houses was named the Athens Coffee House. The other famous one was the Byzantion Coffee House. <laughs> so, folks, ultimately, this amazing world of West Pearl Street. And then, yes, come the late 60s, actually in the early 60s, and this is when Nashville, like most other. Downtowns in America were targeted, it was urban renewal. We must have urban renewal. Oh, oh, look at these horrible places. Look at the way these people, it's the slum. It's the slum. And by the way, it was bad back there. Myrtle Street was probably, you know, really bad at the worst. I have an article from 1962 where the actual Human Rights, Civil Rights and Human Rights Commission of New Hampshire and even the feds came here to Nashua because Myrtle Street was then known as the Negro Ghetto. And that section of Myrtle Street, it was so bad and so blatant. What the people of Nash, or however you want to say it, if you were a person, if you were of African ancestry, if you were black, whatever, you were to live on Myrtle Street. And you were not allowed to live anywhere else in this city. And it was so blatant and so bad. And this is a huge, you're talking two massive pages in the Telegraph. It's actually a fascinating read that someone could do a whole thing on. They came here and literally said to Nashua, you, you can't do this, so, but you, this is just beyond the pale. And, they brought, and this, all of this led to we must demolish these neighborhoods. We have to rid ourselves of this whole you know, wretched color and what's going on. And so Nashua, they did the urban renewal thing. So all of West Pearl Street, you go out there today and you get to what today we call the end of West Pearl Street, you know, is, and you just come out onto this race speedway oval designed for cars and not people. And you go, and there is no West Pearl, it just sort of goes into Central Street now and out on the ledge. So that whole section of the street, which is really this very vivid, colorful section, they, was completely, not only did they just knock the houses down, they obliterated the street so that you never even know such a thing existed there. They also demolished, which is the real tragedy to me, the original boarding houses of the National Manufacturing Company, which are national treasures. Thank God we have a couple that were saved in Lowell. We demolished most of ours. Those were first period, 1820s. And I know a few of them, they were still there up to, and they should have saved one of them, one of them you know, should have been preserved for what it uh, is. Of course, the old brick ceased to be a schoolhouse. It was, by the way, the first high school building in 1851 in Nashua, but then they built a new high school on Main Street in 1853, and it ceased to be a school of any kind, you know, within about 10 or 20 years. Um, so today, West Pearl Street, and I'll do uh, one quick thing here. And uh, I'll tell you who was on West Pearl Street sort of the classic days that maybe a lot of folks here say, let's say Christmas of 1957. Where were you on Christmas of 1957? You know? I know, I wasn't poor either. So who was on West Pearl Street? These are the folks that bought the big Christmas ad. You know, you'd buy the big, uh, the merch on West Pearl Street. Theralt's Men's Shop. Yes? Theralt's? Terry Arts. What am I seeing? I'm, I'm saying it. I'm saying it like a stupid American. Terry Arts. See that? I just blew my credibility right there. Right? 
Terrialts, of course. Terrialts. All right. Fortin the florist. There's the living, breathing. And that's how you phrased in the ad. It was just Fortin the florist in the ad. <laughs> Don Frank, hairstylist. Persian rug galleries. Yes, I'm a like size father. Right? Started on West Pearl. I didn't know that they were on West Pearl Street. Alex Shoes, of course, I knew they started there on West Pearl Street. S. Brody Furs. At a fur shop. Cash and Carry Cleaners. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Miller's. Yes, yeah, started on West Pearl Street. Quality Fruit Exchange. <laughs> Peralt and Smith Furniture. Pero. The Buffet Restaurant. <laughs> That's right, yeah? It's right, okay, yeah? Burke Jewelers, of course, still going strong. Bergeron's, who was at 113 West Pearl then. And I'm proud to say when I got to town, Bergeron's was still there. I have some ties that I still have that I wear that I bought at Bergeron's Men's Shop in 1994, 95. C&R Furniture, Tom's Delicatessen, Tom McGarrian. Tom McGarrion just died, and I was at his funeral. I know I grew up with Tom. He was a family friend. I, uh, I just didn't appreciate how long Tom was there. Victor Lucier, pharmacy. Joshua Sewing Machine was there on West Pearl Street. And, of course, Gaby's. Yeah. This was a shop. And Gaby was there when I started here in 94, and I used to get a kick. And that was like she was just there, I think. Maybe till 95, 96, something, she was right there. She was going out when I got in. And I was fascinated when I got here and, I, and just sit in her shop with her. And the fascinating uh, lady. Um, so West Pearl Street is hung on well. Again, I remember when I came in in 94, just being this vibrant, you know, neat little side street with great family businesses. Some of the most friendly people I met when I got the city were some of the merchants I met, um, you know, on West Pearl Street coming in. And um, it became a one-way street, of course, when they did the whole. And I remember uh, I used to needle Mayor Davidson because I was during Davidson's first administration that they went one way. And I used to, they used to call him one-way Davidson. <laughs> I used to say that to Don. I'm like, Mr. Mayor, why did you call you one-way Davidson? <laughs> like, I have a mind that, Alan. <laughs> <All right. laughs> became a one-way street. I will tell you as a downtown development, I got one-way streets make it really hard for retailing. Business is always better on two-way streets for a whole variety of reasons. But I know it has to do with what happened to our downtowns in the 60s and 70s is transportation planners took over these downtowns. And they said, well, we're going to save your downtown. We're going to make it efficient for cars so people can get through here fast and quick and easy. We did the exact opposite of how you, that's how you destroy the economics of a downtown. We know this now. They did their urban renewal, demolish, you know, these whole sections of it to save it. You destroy it to save it. We know again now, this is not the right way. Thankfully now, we know what you try to do today with downtowns to make them work is to make them what they were. These memorable, meaningful places of mixed use and all these things going on. A place where you're not, if you want somewhere to go quick and fast and easy and you don't care about it, it's meaningless to you, go to the mall. You know, go to the nice commercial strip court of Plaza. Go, park your car. You can literally fall out of your seat into the store so you don't have to walk a foot, God forbid, you know. I don't walk around these horrible places. Downtowns, why they're working again today, thank God, is because we understand now they're places where, fine, you drive there in your car. It's better if you live near there, but fine. Drive there in your car. You park your car once. It doesn't matter where you park your car. I'm going downtown. i got to find a space right in front of where I'm going. I don't want to have to walk around down there like it's this terrible thing you're being inflicted upon you. <laughs> Doesn't matter where you park your car, especially in downtown Nashua. You, know, you can walk anywhere in downtown Nashua in literally four to five minutes. I used to do that. People would complain, <laughs> you know, we need more parking downtown. <laughs> I'd say, do you know how long it takes to walk from the front door of City Hall to the Main Street Bridge? And I'm not, I'm a stubby little Armenian. I don't have like long legs or a big, I mean, it takes maybe 
four minutes, maybe five tops. What a terrible thing. <laughs> and when you walk in these downtowns, this is when life becomes more enriched. I love walking, in down, I love walking downtown. If I walked up Main Street right now, right? If I leave here right now and I, and I just walk up Main Street, I don't, I, I don't know, that's the cool thing, is I'm gonna have spontaneous encounters, I don't even know, right? I couldn't even say it's gonna happen, <laughs> but I know it's gonna happen. I'm gonna see things, I'm gonna run into people, I'm gonna have like some cool memories, and I just know right now if I walked up Main Street, this would happen, because I'm walking and I'm lingering, and I'm using the place like it should be used to enjoy and to spend time. Uh, downtowns are not about saving time, it's about time well spent, time well spent. Uh, that's why downtowns are coming back and you have a great new generation of people finally that are realizing, you know, this is not about in-out fast utility, it's about really, you know, making the most of the time in the place. So don't worry about walking around, your sidewalks will all be fixed soon. <laughs> it's a rough thing to go through right now, but I knew Paul Newman, my mentor, not Paul Newman the actor, Paul Newman the great legendary urban program manager of Nashua for almost 30 years. When the brick sidewalks were put in in the early 80s, mid 80s, it was hell. And it's hell now. Anytime you rip up sidewalks in a downtown, but it's all good. The new trees will grow fast. <laughs> As I've learned now that I turned 50 this year, which I can't believe, I learned how fast 10 years goes by. It is amazing. Everything will come together out there. It's gonna be beautiful. Downtown Nashua, I must say. And I've worked all over New England, done downtown work all over, and I've kept saying for many years, ah, I'm gonna go in this new city, it's gonna be just like Nashua, we'll do great things, and I can honestly say, no place that I have practiced my profession since has been as joyful and really special and wonderful as Nashua. This city is truly, truly a remarkable and very special place it has a very unique culture. Uh, the connectivity of the families, the multi-generational family businesses, the way they care about this downtown and the whole thing is unlike, I'm telling you folks, almost anything else out there. And I've been around now since I've been away from the city for 10 years. I've worked a lot of, nothing compares to it. I keep saying it's gonna be like that again. And no, it won't, and it will be. This place is one in a million. Uh, so what's going to happen going forward with West Pearl Street and the Broad Street Parkway and how that whole new area, the old West End neighborhood, can be redeveloped and renaissanced? Everyone get involved in it, bring it back to its historic fabric and pattern, <coughs> make it mixed use, make it walkable, make it human scale, and, uh, you know, Someone will be standing here 50 years from now, 100 years from now, talking about what you all did during your time here. And, uh, you know, that's going to be an interesting lecture in the future. Maybe, so, maybe it'll be you. You might last long. I'll never make it, man. I'll never make it. So, folks, this was a privilege for me to come back and to do this. What um, City Arts Nashua is doing, public art is at the core of why you want to get out of your car in a place and say, we want to walk around here, I want to stop, I want to linger, I want to look at this, drink it in, value it, be enriched by it, this type of public art. And I can remember a long time years ago and they'd say, oh yeah, this arts and all that stuff, that's after, let's talk about business first. Let's talk about what's, and then, you know, that little sideshow window dress, they can do that fine little stuff if they want to fool around with that. This is the core of the economics of place and how you make the economics of a downtown work again. By bringing back people, filling the sidewalks with people, this is what does it. So again, I'm honored that I have an opportunity to support it. It's right at the heart of what, you know, I've dedicated my pre professional life to, and boy, I can't wait to walk down there and take a cool picture of it to put on my Facebook page, you know? <laughs> Here we go. All right. All right. Oh.
And next time, let's go out in the street and do this, you know?